Under the guidance of a team of internationally certified instructors, students will learn the fundamentals of chess strategy, tactics, and other key concepts in a fun and highly engaging way. Dubai Chess Club also offers ladies-only training program for women in environment to train. Shown that chess is a great way to strengthen memory, enhance creativity, develop problem-solving skills, and boost the analytical abilities of children. Moreover, it teaches children the value of planning and foresight, and helps instill discipline, self-confidence, perseverance, and sportsmanship. Children who study chess are also known to improve their academic performance. A child who makes great chess moves can make great life moves. Hello everyone, welcome back once again. This is Coach Dmax of the Dubai Chess and Culture Club. All right, uh, welcome to our uh, stream on the, the ongoing Lindor's Abbey Rapid Challenge. Um, it's a rest day for today, and tomorrow we'll, we'll start the quarterfinals of this event. In the quarterfinals, uh, the top player in the eliminations, which is uh, Ikaro Nakamura, will be playing the number eight seed, um, Levon Aronian. Number two, after the eliminations, Sergei Karyakin will be playing Daniel Dubov. And then Yu Yang Yi will be playing Ding Liren. And the most exciting match for tomorrow will be Wesley So against the world champion Magnus Carlsen. All right, uh, the tournament is uh, 15 minutes plus 10 seconds increment. This is the second leg, by the way, of this Magnus Carlsen chess tour, where you have a prize fan of 1 million US dollars. In the first event, uh, Magnus Carlsen Invitational, it was won by Magnus Carlsen himself. So this is the second event in the chess tour. So tomorrow will be exciting, quarterfinals. And here, here are our games by our quarter finalists. Let's check the games. Let's start with the number one in the eliminations with 7.5 out of 11, Hikaru Nakamura of the USA. Okay, this game, the first game, his uh, opponent here was our the, the youngest of the group, Ali Riza Piruza. And Nakamura is playing white. All right, let's get to it. So Naka played d4. By the way, uh, we are simulcast live again on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And you follow us at Dubai Chess on Instagram. Okay, let's go to the game. We have knight f3, d5, e3, e6, b3, bishop b2, castles, and bishop d3. Okay, this is a 19th century setup by Nakamura. Okay, the, the players in the 19th century, this is the Kohli Zuckertort line. Okay, you have Kohli, you have Zuckertort last time, right? the, the contemporaries in chess. We had the Capablancas last time, the Steins in the 19th century. Okay, so B6 was played by Feruza. It's nice to have this bishop here. That knight jumps to E5 later on with a potential F4. This bishop also will work if opponent plays C5, you can capture that pawn in C5, and that would help in the attack on the knight on F6. So we'll see what happens. Nakamura castles, bishop goes to b7. So black is employing the Queen's Indian against the Kohli. So the Kohli Zuckertort line played by white. So now bd2, Naka played knight bd2. C5, a3. Okay, the main point of a3 is to stop the idea of knight to c6 to knight b4. That knight on b4 takes away that attacking piece on b3. So that's a prophylactic a3 move. 
96, takes on c5, opening the line of the dark square bishop, takes, and then c4, all right? Clearing the way for the queen on c2. Now we have a bishop on d3, a queen on c2, attacking rate seven, all right? Okay, so a5 was played by Feruza, takes on d5, takes on d5, okay, queen c2. Now we have this c5 and d5 hanging pawns. And by the way, shout out to our viewers, Kim Yap, Upper Chepper, okay? And the, other, uh, the others who are watching as well at home. Okay, so we have queen c2. Now the threat is bishop takes f6 and bishop takes h7. But Firuza didn't mind. Okay, he played a4. The main problem with uh, this bishop is that it is an overworked piece because it's protecting f6. At the same time, it's also protecting c5. Okay, so h a4, rook ad1, centralizing the rook. At the same time, moving away from threat. When you capture that knight on f6, the rook now is not on a1. Okay, takes and b3 takes. Of course, c4 is not possible here because rook d1 is there. There's a queen on the queen. So that fork is not available. Black played queen b6. And now comes the idea bishop takes f6. Removal of the guard, removing the defender of the h7 pawn. Bishop, okay, pawn took on f6. If, if bishop, for example, takes, White has knight takes c5, but he can also capture this one first. And then after that one only, then he will take up c5. So taking two pawns. So black went for takes an f6 with the pawn. Takes king h8. Now he's black relies on this pawn c and this rook on a3. But Nakamura now has a strong attack on the king with knight h4. And the hidden threat here is this queen e2 to queen h5. Another way is also f4, rook f3, rook h3. But which one will Nakamura choose? Opponent play 95. Okay, he went for knight f5. Of course, you cannot take this bishop here. This one, knight takes e7, this covert attack. Okay. Firuza went for rook takes a3, rook. Queen attacking the knight, <clears throat> but not knight. It's not needed. Nakamura just needs the queen, the bishop, and the knight. He went for queen e2. Okay. If, for example, you take that bishop, okay, in the game, rook a4 was played. Now, if black captures the bishop, what happens here? We have queen h5 check. After king g8, Queen h6, the mate on g7 is unstoppable. The unstoppable mate on the g7 weak point. Okay, so after that, Firuza uh, went for rook a4. He cannot also capture the b3 knight. And now queen h5. Bishop comes to g6 and queen h7 mate. All right, a shout out to Mira watching as well. Okay, rook. To a8, for example, here black already resigned. Why, why did he resign? Of course, there's bishop to b6, g6, sorry, king to g8, queen h7, and then queen h8, mate. Right? So the mate is unstoppable. You cannot stop the mate. A very nice knight on f5. That's how you deal with the double pawn, you put an outpost on that square. And that knight on f5 cannot be driven away because there's no e pawn and there's no g pawn. Once there's a double pawn, try to find an outpost on that file, right? And that's a pretty good win by Nakamura. Now, speaking of the Zuckerkort line, okay, Nakamura here played Cody Zuckerkort. Okay, let's look at this Koli Zuckertort line by Nakamura. It's, it is, it was played, okay, this Zuckertort Koli line was played in the 19th century. And it, uh, it takes us to that time. And what comes to mind is this game by 
Zuckertort himself. He was playing uh, this guy Blackburn in the 19th century. And just, just go through the game. It started with English. Okay. So knight f3, bishop to e2, castles. Black also employed the Queen's Indian. Same as what the rules of play. He played also the Queen's Indian. Okay. So Zuckertort played d4, transpose now to the Queen's pawn. Now b3. It's uh, almost the same as what Nakamura played with b3, that the bishop goes to b2. Only difference is that Nakamura's bishop is on d3, Zuckertort's bishop is on e2. All right. But we'll see this game. Okay, so knight b5, knight takes on d6, changing the outpost on e4, driving it away, takes, bishop takes c4, now bishop on d3, now the powerful bishops, the powerful bishops, right? Okay. Rook c8. Oh, thanks, thanks Manoj. All right, rook a e1. Okay, now the pieces now are ready. Rook, the bishops, when your pieces are ready, time for the kill, time for the attack. e4. Black has actually controlled the c file with the two rooks right here. So Blackburn, Blackburn controlled the c file, but look at the two bishops, look at the scope of the two bishops, right? So the rook cannot get in. So that's immaterial. The control of the c-file is immaterial. Now white continues his attack on the king side. F4, all right. Rook e3, rook lift. Takes. Knight takes f6. Okay, uh, we have, uh, will there be a competition in UAE for this eight holidays? Yes, we will have uh, a competition on the 26th, May 26th. It's uh, organized by the Abu Dhabi Chess Club. So I will be streaming uh, the tournament as well, 9 p.m. on May 26. All right, let's go back to the game. Here White's played a five, okay. exploiting the pin on the queen and breaking also the structure, breaking the structure in front of the enemy king. Okay, 94 is played takes. Takes on g6, rook on c2, takes on h7, okay, an intermediate move, intermezzo. King on h8, another intermezzo. Check on the king. e5, and a beautiful queen sacrifice by Zuckertort. Okay, beautiful queen sacrifice. Now, here, black played rook c5. Now, let's look at queen takes b4 here. Now what happens if queen takes b4? Queen takes b4, white has, bishop takes e5, of course. Okay, now king takes the pawn. Now we have rook h3 check. In, in chess we have three, we have the number three. Three is a main, so any three pieces can deliver Checkmate. Okay, the king cannot go back to g8 because we have rook h8 main. Okay, so king goes to g6, we have rook f6 check. The coordination of the three pieces. Now king goes to g5, we have rook g3 check. King cannot go h4, if king h4, rook h6 is already a main. And the king goes to h5, rook f5 check. King goes to h6, bishop f4 check. All right, a nice harmony of the two rooks and the bishop. And the king is checkmated because there are no pawns in front of the king. The game is over, all right? And if you look at the side of this board, the pieces are wrongly placed on the queen side. And we have a lonely king on the king side. Okay, this was a beautiful game by Zohan Zuckerberg, this, uh, this game, I was reminded of this game because of the Nakamura game when he played Koli Zuckerberg, all right? So that's again, the role of the role of classics. Okay, so 
Nakamura again will be playing his number one, seven point five. Now Nakamura will be playing Levon Aronian in the quarterfinals tomorrow. And speaking of Levon Aronian, let's look at how he played in this tournament. Okay, Levon Aronian in this game played Ali Riza Peruza once again, and he employed the same thing. He also played the Koli Zopertort line following Hikaru. So he followed Hikaru's uh, game. Maybe he thought, okay, Ali Riza, a young boy, maybe not so much into the classics. So he played a classical game, but we'll see what happens. Castles, now we have C4. Takes on, by the way, another thing here, important thing here is that when the opponent plays knight b4, attacking the bishop, you can just simply play bishop e2. Okay, if this queen, for example, plays uh, queen, you can play a3. Knight goes back, you can take the pawn, and you can also take the knight and f6. Okay, so it's not actually losing tempo when play back on e2. Okay, so castles. C4 takes, takes. Rook E1, C5. Okay, now we have one majority, three or two. Okay, one majority for white on the queen side. G3, A3. Now B4, Rook to C1. Okay, B5. White continues his advantage on the queen side. So bishop to e8, he played rook c2, maybe a bit too slow. He can just go for like bishop c3 and then a5, yes? This is a bit too slow, rook c2 is too slow. Knight f5, it allows black to get back into the game with a counterplay on this king side, with a slow rook c2 move. Okay, after bishop c3, now h5. Now h4, black's only counterplay, of course, because now white is controlling the other side of the board. We have two sides of the board, king side and the queen side. So black has his counterplay on the king side, the important side of the board. Okay, takes. Knight on h5. Okay, knight f1, protecting g3. Knight goes back to f6. Okay, rook b1, but Aronian could have played a6 here. Continue with your plan. If captures, then just capture with the rook. And continue the pawn push. But he went for rook b1. Knight e4 takes, takes, and Ariza played a good move. a6. Now the bishop comes into c6. The light square weakness is a bit problematic for white. Queen e8. And now black's counterplay is very obvious now. Takes. Now the sudden turn. It's now black controlling the game. The rook comes to h5. Takes. Knight h2. King takes g7. Red f3. Double up. Queen to d8. Red rook d2. Queen f6. Black is already winning because he cannot capture, for example, this rook on c6, uh, the court bishop on c6 is not possible because it's queen a1. And if you play king g2, rook takes h2 is a mate. Okay, so rook bb2 was played by Aronian, blocking the threat of the queen on a1. Rook h3, good move. Rook h5, nice. Now here, knight g4 was played. After that, black made the mistake of playing g5. This was a losing move for black. After that, white again, the, the, the twist and turn, white gets back into the game and controls the important ending. Now, if Firuza, this is also a critical game, had Firuza, had he won the game, he could have qualified for the top eight. This was also an important game for uh, Eliza Firuza. Here, black has this move, rook h4, where he missed the sacrifice of the rook. Again, that queen on f6 is not free. You cannot take the queen on f6 because there's rook h2 made. 
the control of this bishop on the line squares and the two rooks right here. Okay, G5 was played, it was a blunder. Now Aronian was quick, he was alert, right, to stop the attack, he changed the king. And now after take, knight takes E5, bishop D5, king to E3, king to D5, uh, king to D4, sorry, and now the pass pawn. The pass pawn, Jason G5, king on C5, and the knight on G4, another blunder by, by black. And that ends his fate in the tournament. And that's also a big plus for Aronian because Aronian actually beat Grishuk by a very slim margin in the tie breaks. They both have five and a half points. But Grishuk was out uh, according to tie break. So it's Firuza, in, uh, Firuza out as well, and then Aronian in. So Aronian will be playing Hikaru Nakamura, and this game is very important. Okay, so the importance of every game here. Black could have won by playing this beautiful Rook H4 move. Now why? If the pawn captures the Rook, the screen takes H4. There's no other way because if this king goes to e2, takes the knight, king try to, tries to escape, there's a pin on the queen on the there's a pin on the queen by the rook. And if the queen protects on g3, there's rook f1. King takes the rook, takes the queen, take the pawn, and it would be too much for white to handle. So it was an important game here. Aron and won. He qualifies and will be playing Nakamura. Unfortunately for Firuza, after losing this game, he settled for nothing because only the top eight were qualifying for the quarterfinals for the knockout event. Okay. And with that, Aron got his ticket. He feels sorry for the young Firuza. Okay, but he had his chances, but that is chess. All right. Now let's move on to the next contender. And the next contender is, of course, the world number one himself, Magnus Carlsen. Okay. Now let's look at Magnus Carlsen's game in this tournament, in the elimination phase. Here he was playing white against Aronian as black. So you have e4. We have the Petrov, or we call it the Russian game. Okay, knight takes e5. The nature of this game is a bit equal. Shall we say the drawish nature of the game? The, the Russian player Petrov uh, employed this particular line if you want to probably draw with some strong, strong, stronger players, yes. Okay, so knight f3, chasing e4, knight c3, an aggressive uh, way takes bishop e3. Now, black, white is, of course, trying to go for the long castling. Queen d2, knight d7, castles on the queen side. H4, D5, Bishop to D3. Now, White is threatening Knight G5. And he, after Rook E1, he actually played Knight to G5. Okay, so Ronya went C5. Carson has C4, fourth. He went for H6, and Carson didn't mind. He took the pawn on d5 and he sacrificed that knight on g5 okay question is why black played c4 first he wants to take away that bishop if that bishop is potentially a threatening a7 check took on c4 then black took the knight on g5 now we have knight e4. But then again, white has queen b1. 
Now you're threatening queen h5 and queen h8 mate. So black took g5, queen h5, bishop takes, and he went for f5. He thought that he could run away, but how can you run away when Carlson has this important line clearance for this discovered attack with g6? Bishop e6 was played, queen h7 check, and here black resign. And why did he resign? For example, he plays king f8. White has this beautiful queen takes f5 move. The queen is not free, by the way, because if you take the queen, there's rook h8. Again, you only need a pawn, that bishop, and that rook. So the number three. Three is m8. And if you block it with the queen, for example, here, why can't just simplify? You can take the knight with the queen, you take the one, and he can take this bishop, and he's also threatening rook h8. Also threatening mate, right? And if uh, you put your knight over there, why can't take it with the rook if you take? It's still a mate with rook h8. No matter what you do, it's a mate. So Aronian after queen h7, he's, he, has, he, has sent, uh, he, has, he has seen enough and just resigned. Same thing if king f7, white also has queen takes f5, exploiting the pin on the bishop here, pin on the diagonal. Then after queen f6, for example, again, same thing. Queen takes knight, you take the bishop, takes with the check, game over. If rook is six, for example, you can just exchange, right? You can exchange here, or you can, you can even play rook f3 as well. Uh, a pin, pin on the queen on f6, so this is just too bad for black. And that win also helped Magnus Carlsen to qualify to get his spot in the quarterfinals, and also an important win against Aronian. And also another win by Magnus in the last round was critical. It was a win against Perusa. And that makes, uh, that qualifies Magnus to the quarterfinals, and his opponent in the quarterfinals is Wesley Saw. Formerly playing for the Philippines, and now Wesley is uh, representing America. It's a strong American team composed of Nakamura, Caruana, you have Wesley So, you have the young Jeffrey Shaw, uh, Robson, you have Shankland, strong team. It would have been nice if Wesley stayed in the Philippines, but uh, okay. It was also a good decision for him to play in the US, uh, chess-wise, okay, chess-wise. So let's look at Wesley Saw's uh, journey here in this tournament. And one of his games, and uh, one of his uh, pretty games was against Wei Yi of China. Okay, uh, Wesley was white, Wei Yi was black. We have E4, E5, we have knight c6, we have bishop c4. We have the Italian, or we call it also the Giocopianissimo castles, nine of six, d3, c3, typical Italian, typical Giocopiano, a6, rook to e1, a6, stopping bishop g5, a4, black castles. Knight bd2, everything is just normal. Okay, knight e7, trying to transfer to g6. Knight f1, same as white. Bishop to b3, uh, anticipating, this one is anticipating d5, all right. So bishop b3, now d5 is not possible because there's a take on e5. Knight g6, knight on g3, bishop on b6. Probably a bit questionable here. It would have been nice if bishop a7 
you will see why Bishop B6 was not the best move because in the latter part of the game, that big bishop becomes a target by white. Okay. So here, white man for d4, takes, takes, bishop on g4, h3. After take on f3, here's an interesting recapture by white with g takes f3. Okay. Now, the king is not safe, but white was ready for it. He has e5. He has f4. Black went for queen h4. White just ignored. He went for knight f5. Okay, imagine this a4 move. This a4 move is not just, okay, the main point of a4. Let's go back. Okay, let's say for example here, a h6, right, a4. The main point of a4 is to play b4 as if let's say black castle, you have b4, and then you trap the bishop, right? But also in the middle game, white can make use of that line after opening d4, takes, it opens up the line for the rook over there on a3, okay? Making use of that A file for the rook lift, and you can transfer that rook on the king side. Bishop C2 protects the knight. Knight on H4 takes, queen takes H4, rook on A3. All right, rook G3 is coming. F5, king on G2, nice one. If black tries to exchange the queen in d4, take, take, you can go for rook d1 first, and then you can go f5, d6, or pass pawn. Or you can even play bishop to g6 here. This unstoppable pawn is right here. Okay, so rook a e8 was played. Rook b6, that was the problem with that bishop on b6. Now, if we go back into the game, for example, if here, after knight g3, instead of bishop b6, if he played bishop a7, right? Let's say bishop a7. And if Wesley tries to play the move takes, takes, bishop g4, let's go through it again, once again. h3, take, take, let's say b5, e5. This knight goes to h7, and you have f4. You have queen h4, you have knight here, queen takes h3, bishop c2, and then knight h4, takes, 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 and if you play rook a3, for example, let's say f5, king g2, and then rook a e8, again, there's no, like, rook g3, uh, rook b3 move, right? But in this one, there's rook b3. Now, black has to get back to d8. Queen on h5. Knight on f6. Queen takes f5. Knight e4. Queen g6. It took on d4. Nice sacrifice by white on the knight. Rook to g3. Threatening g7. Well, Wesley could have just captured the pawn here as well. Okay, it's still unstoppable. If queen to d7, you can play queen h7 check. King f7, there's bishop g6. Let's say king to e6, bishop takes e8. Rook takes e8, queen g6 check, right? King has to go g5, and then there's bishop e3. He could have gone for that one. But Wesley went for rook g3 here. Queen d7. Takes an a6, which is a mistake. Again, takes an e4. Bishop or queen. Rook f7. Now bishop to b3, queen. Here with queen takes h6, black would have survived with rook takes e5. Probably he was worried that there is bishop e3 check, but there's rook d5. He could have survived. But he went for rook f7. I mean, that's human. Probably the time as well. 
So bishop b3, check, queen h4. Okay, just gaining time, queen h5. Rook to g6, queen h8 back, take the rook, and bishop e6. Here, black resigned. And why did he resign? For example, here, queen goes to d8. Black can just, white can just simply play queen check. Right, queen check. And if let's say king goes to e8, there's bishop f7. If king goes to e6, there's rook d6. You take the rook and it's a mate. And also that's that's an extra piece of your bishop e6. You cannot also go for like queen d6. Because for that one, okay, white can just play, let's say bishop e3. You cannot take this one because rook h7 is already made. Takes on e6, queen g8, queen f5, queen f7, queen here, rook g5, sorry, rook g5. King takes on f4, takes rook f5, and then f5 is made. Okay, so look at that. Bishop e3 wins one piece of a strong attack by Wesley, but using, okay, using this one. Eh? Look at this. The helpful a4 move. Look at this a4 move, eh? the helpful a4 move. The rook cliff later on with the rook. Okay, making use of the A file for your group. So that's also a very instructive game by Wesley. He knows that his king will not be safe. It's an open king, but the rook comes to the rescue. The rook not only defends the king, but it also attacks the enemy king. So it's a multi-dimensional move. A multi-purpose move, rook a3. So that's probably another important strategic play when you play a4. Okay, so you can transfer that rook on that side of the board. Rook on g3, right? Then after that, an easy win for resting. Okay, so with this, Wesley again will be playing Magnus Carlsen tomorrow in the quarterfinals. All right? Now, the, the next quarterfinalist is Daniel Dubov of Russia, another strong young player. And how strong is Dubov? Okay, in this game that we're trying to check, Dubov beat none other than. Magnus Carlsen himself, okay? Okay, Dubov was black. They just played the same line about a few days ago in the Steinitz Memorial. Okay, this was the same line played by Magnus and Dubov in the Steinitz Memorial. Castles, A4. It was a draw in the silent stream So rook e1. Knight to c5. H6. G4. Um, I, I don't like g4 here, but uh, that's Magnus Carlsen. I also played this nine as white against Kachlinskaya. Uh, one of the strong uh, women players in, in Europe. I also played this as a white, but uh, I don't like g4 here. Um, main plan could be f3 here for white, put that bishop on e3 back, and then put that bishop on f2. If, for example, queen to b6, that bishop goes back to e3, and bishop f2. All right, and this pawn pushes to f4. Let's say g6 and you have f4. This was much better than what happened in the game. Okay, so g4 was, was played by Magnus. Dubo went for queen b6, rook d, rook d1. This pawn on b2 is actually not free you now because this rook d1 is a poison pawn. Queen a3, rook a1, 
queen b4, rook e b1, queen on c4, you have bishop f1. And if you take the knight upon the stake knight, take, take this one, take queen, take. If you play rook to e4, just c3, because if you play c5, there's f3. There's also a counterplay on the rook. So that's a long line, poison pawn on b2. Okay, so bishop d7 was played. b3, bishop on g3, king h2, f3, queen f2, h5, nice move. And Carlson missed this move. Very good move by Dubov, h4. Takes, knight h5. Now threatening bishop e5, you cannot play f4 here, right? If you play f4, this knight takes f4. You cannot take the knight, then bishop e5. So knight c e2 played by Magnus, g5, nice. Takes, rook e8, rook takes d1, queen on c7. Magnus pieces are very passive. Do ball is just threatening on all fronts. Now knight takes f4 is coming. Magnus had to play knight g1, another passive square for the knight. Knight e4, white is just playing for survival here. Bishop f5, look at the coordination of black's pieces. Knight, the rook, the bishop, this bishop, right? So the targets. Yeah, so bishop f3, okay, maybe not Rook e7, maybe queen b8, possible. Went for rook e7, queen c1, queen b6, takes, knight f3, knight on c3, takes one pawn, black is one pawn up, knight e2. Magnus was okay. He, he could play here probably knight g3 and take that pawn on h5, but shockingly, Magnus played bishop f2. A shocking move by the world champion, losing a piece on e2, right? So it could have been maybe he was running low on time and he played a pre-move. He wasn't probably expecting that bishop move. He probably was expecting maybe king g7 and protect the pawn in g6, all right? So he was looking for bishop f2 now, and then king g6, that was that what he was thinking. But Dubov played knight c3 here, and then Magnus pre-moved with bishop f2, the knight on e2 is lost. Okay, that's another important factor in online chess. There's pre-move, okay? So when you want to gain time, you can play fast by playing a move while your opponent is still thinking, right? you can pre-move. But the problem is, this is a very bad pre-move. And that knight is just dead on e2, and that game. And this game qualifies Dubov in the quarterfinals. And in the quarterfinals, Dubov will be playing Sergei Karyakin. Karyakin is a former challenger to the World Championship. He lost to Magnus Carlsen with that um, famous Queen H6 sacrifice by Magnus. Okay, let's look at Sergei Karyakin in one of his games in this tournament. Let's check out. We have E4. Knight of F3. We have the Sicilian takes. He's playing against John Christoph Duda, another young player, strong player from Poland. Okay, bishop g5, all right, four. We have the poison pawn of the Sicilian Nador, all right, the poison pawn variation of the Sicilian Nador, all right, black is brave, right? He was so brave, he took the pawn, he took the poison pawn. Okay, rook b1, f5. Okay, white's compensation of the poison pawn, a more developed piece, 
underdeveloped for black. So knight c6 takes on e6, knight takes on c6, and then bishop e2. Black's problem in this game would be this bishop on c8. All right. Bishop e7. Now black will try to castle. White has e5. Another pawn sacrifice. Okay, black now has two, four, six pawns against four, right? The white sacrificed two pawns, but what is the compensation? It starts with this takes, takes. Bishop h5 check, very nice check. g6, and now knight e4. That's the centralized knight. Remember the game by Nakamura in the first game, where um, Perusa had double pawns on f6 and f7, then put knight on f5. Same thing. Black has double pawns, put an outpost on e4. Very strong one. No pawn can drive away the knight. Now it's threatening knight takes f6. So black castle. White also castled, threatening knight takes f6. Bishop g7 takes the rook, takes, and then bishop f3. Rook a7. Now black tries to survive, but now rook b8, a pin. Rook b7, queen a5. The activity of white's pieces. There's a pin on the rook, the threat of the queen. All right, c5, e5, strong knight on e4. Takes queen. All right, bishop g4, threatening rook takes c8. Takes, and then fork on e6. So king f7, rook takes e8. What else can black do here? If king f8, this bishop takes e6, there's a pin. This is what we call a zugzwang position. Any move to be played by black already is a losing move. So that was a very nice positional sacrifice First was the b2 pawn, the poison pawn. And the clearance sacrifice with e5, so that the knight can jump on an important e4 square, the strong knight over there. That strong knight. Main problem for black, that bishop on c8. So after king f7 takes, although it's not so easy from here, black tries to fight, but what I like here is Karyakin's handling of the end game. Okay, how to take advantage of the extra piece. King d2, h3, no problem. He went for bishop b7, he has the c6 square to take an a5. If, for example, you take this pawn here, he has knight a7. He will go for knight c6 and this one. This is a bit slow. These two pawns are a bit slow. Okay. So bishop c5, king. King c4, g4. Knight. King goes to the pawn on h3, but white is ready. Takes, no problem. He has a bishop. White has seen enough, yes? A5, no problem. Well, bishop A7. Okay, you cannot push this pawn. Eh? You play H3, there's knight D4 blocking the bishop. You play H2, bishop takes E4. Unstoppable pawn. So bishop A7 first, no problem. Takes. Then I d2, king d5, and then c4. g3 takes the pawn, and then c5, and stuck will pass on. 
But then again, uh, the two important sacrifice in the game by Sergey Karakin, the former challenger in the World Championship, won the sacrifice in the one B2. The next one was this clearance sacrifice on E5. And the big problem for Black is that Bishop on C8, he loses the Bishop and then he loses the game. All right, with that said, Karyakin qualified. It was actually number two. He's playing Dubov number seven in the quarterfinals. And the last pairing for the quarterfinals is between Ding Li Ren and his countryman, Yu, Yu Yang Yi. So with that, we, we have a semifinalist from China, all right? We have two quarterfinalists from China. So whoever wins, we knew for sure that there's one semifinalist from China. Okay, let's say, so it looks, let's look at Ding Liren. Okay, in one of his games against the young star Wei Yi, also from China. Okay, let's look at the game, D4. C3. So we're looking at look, we're looking at the eight games from the quarterfinalists here, right? So this is more of like a primer for the quarterfinals for tomorrow. Okay, look at how Ding Liren takes advantage of his one majority two versus one. Simple plan, simple chess. Okay, queen versus one, a four takes. All right, we have the outside pass pawn. Okay, one pawn is enough to win the game. Knight c4, h3, knight on b6, nice move. Takes three pawn. Okay, one pawn, just one pawn. Rook c5, check, takes, simplify, g4. This is very instructive. In G2, rook to B5, H4, H5. Potentially, that H6 pawn is a target. That's why you do not take on G5. Huh? You visualize in the end, okay, I will target that pawn in H6. King, the king will help. Okay. Push, king will help. Then rook, push, now rook b8, coming. King, king, blocking it. King, king, the king goes to c6. And the rook to b8 is coming. If black stops it with rook d7, for example, there's rook b7. You take that king goes to b7, the game is over. Well, very simple and very instructive win by Ding Liren against his countryman, Wei. And with that, Ding Liren qualifies. He gets a slot to the quarterfinals, playing another Chinese, Yu Yang Yi. And Yu Yang Yi, by the way, in the eliminations, defeated Ding Liren himself. So it's an intriguing match between these two. But of course, they are good friends. You never know. They're, they may be friends uh, outside of the board, but once they fight, they probably fight till, you know, it's may, may, maybe it may the best one win, uh, may the best man win. Okay, so this is the last game. Yu Yang Yi against uh, Ding Li Ren. Yu Yang Yi White. So we have the Brinfeld takes e4. One of the most aggressive lines in the Brinfeld. e6, knight g5, knight takes on e6, takes bishop e3. White has a potential h4, h5 threat. Takes, okay, h4, cancels, knight e4. D5 takes the bishop, uh, takes the knight, 
that D6 point is going to be a target, but there's also a rook takes F2 and B2, so you got to be careful. White played G3, bishop H3. Okay, centralizing the rook. King B1 takes F4. Now the knight on D6 should be coming now. Takes rook C8. White tries to simplify. This is a mistake by Ding Liren against Yu Yang Yi. Here, Ding Liren could have played knight C2, probably better for black, right? What, what's the point? Okay, let's say rook takes F8, for example, and then rook takes F8. And you want to go rook, let's say, E7, okay? There's A3. Because if you take this pawn, this knight takes A3 and then B2. So you really cannot go there. And if you play rook e2, a3 is a very strong move. Oops. Take, take. If you play king a1, uh, sorry, king c1, the bishop just goes d4, and b2 is also coming. But Ding Liren did not play that one. He went for takes. Uh, sorry, he went for a3 first. The main difference is that after knight c2, there's rook e5. Wow. Now you may ask the question, what happens if earlier a3 right here, and then after knight c2, takes takes, what happens if rook e5? You cannot play rook e5 now because this bishop takes e3, takes, and there's just knight e3, take the board. You cannot move the bishop because this made on f1, yes. So here, white has this rook e5. Probably Ding Liren missed this move, rook e5. Bishop e6, knight f7, station b3. And now the pass pawn for white. The two strong connected pass pawns. King e4. Knight to d8, unstoppable pawns, takes, and then d6, bishop d5, bishop c6, king d5. How can you stop e6, e7? Unstoppable, right? King goes f8, e6, e7, and that wins for white. And that gives a slot for Yu Yang Yi in the quarterfinals, playing against his con countryman Ding Liren. Also, probably an exciting match between the two Chinese. That means one Chinese will qualify for the semifinals. So again, the matches for tomorrow. Don't forget, Nakamura will be playing Aronian. That will be exciting as well. Uh, we have Karyakin against Dubov. We have Ding Liren against Wu Yang Yi. And another match will be Wesley So against Magnus Crossan. So that's the quarterfinals for the Lindor's Abbey Rapid Challenge. This is the second leg of the Magnus Crossan chess tour, where you have a prize fund of 1 million US dollars. Imagine chess is surviving in this pandemic, right? There's money in chess nowadays. You cannot really play any other games except this game that we have. It's good that we have chess. We cannot play football. We cannot play basketball. This COVID thing is just crazy, right? And this is probably the new normal for us now. All right. So again, guys, uh, don't forget, we, we, we are on Twitter. We are on Facebook and YouTube, and you follow us on Instagram, follow us at Dubai Chess, right? Thank you guys for watching. And another announcement on May 26th, uh, there will be this Eid uh, tournament organized by the Abu Dhabi Chess and Culture Club, May 26th at 9 p.m. Dubai time. I will be streaming the games over there as well. Okay, I will see you then. Stay home, stay safe, play chess. This is Coach D-Max signing off. 
Bye, everyone. Dubai, Dubai Chess, chess and, culture and Culture Club, Club. Invite, invite parents, parents to, enroll to enroll their children, children to, the to the Club's Chess, chess School, school. And, and enjoy the wide-ranging wide benefits, benefits of chess, of chess as, a tool, as a tool for education, education and skill development. development. Under the Under guidance, the guidance of, a of a team of internationally certified, certified instructors, instructors, students, students will, will learn the fundamentals, the fundamentals of chess strategy, of strategy tactics, tactics, and other key concepts in a fun and highly engaging way. Dubai Chess Club also offers ladies-only training program for women to have a comfortable environment to train. Studies have shown that chess is a great way to strengthen memory, enhance creativity, develop problem-solving skills, and boost the analytical abilities of children. Moreover, it teaches children the value of planning and foresight, and helps instill discipline, self-confidence, perseverance, and sportsmanship. Children who study chess are also known to improve their academic performance. A child who makes great chess moves can make great life moves. Dubai Chess and Culture Club invite parents to enroll their children to the club's chess school and enjoy the wide-ranging benefits of chess as a tool for education and skill development. Under the guidance of a team of internationally certified instructors, students will learn the fundamentals of chess strategy, tactics, and other key concepts in a fun and highly engaging way. Dubai Chess Club also offers ladies-only training program for women to have a comfortable environment to train. Studies have shown that chess is a great way to strengthen memory, enhance creativity, develop problem-solving skills, and boost the analytical abilities of children. Moreover, it teaches children the value of planning and foresight, and helps instill discipline, self-confidence, perseverance, and sportsmanship. Children who study chess are also known to improve their academic performance. A child who makes great chess moves can make great life moves. Dubai Chess and Culture Club invite parents to enroll their children to the club's chess school and enjoy the wide-ranging benefits of chess as a tool for education and skill development. Under the guidance of a team of internationally certified instructors, students will learn the fundamentals of chess strategy, tactics, and other key concepts in a fun and highly engaging way. Dubai Chess Club also offers ladies-only training program for women to have a comfortable environment to train. Studies have shown that chess is a great way to strengthen memory, enhance creativity, develop problem-solving skills, and boost the analytical abilities of children. Moreover, it teaches children the value of planning and foresight, and helps instill discipline, self-confidence, perseverance, and sportsmanship. Children who study chess are also known to improve their academic performance. A child who makes great chess moves can make great life moves.